Um, this is another talk on DDGs, uh, but actually is not. Um, we really initiated the, the, uh, the research looking at the interaction between fiber and fat uh, uh, to see what impact that had on digestion, um, but recognizing that even when we're using low-fat uh, DDGs, in this case it was about 5% oil, you still have oil in the DDG, so we really couldn't uh, say, refer to the DDGs as fiber. Uh, so it's low-fat DDGs um, and uh, with solubles and soybean oil, and we looked at the uh, impact on the digestibility of fat, fiber, and amino acids. So uh, just by way of background, uh, we know that obviously the inclusion of co-products of corn processing will increase fiber content of the diet. Uh, we keep in mind uh, that the fiber in corn uh, is very rich in polymers of glucose, undigestible glucose in the uh, form of cellulose, and, and as xylose and arabinoxylose in arabinoxylans, the consequences of this is, is that the fiber is insoluble and therefore not very fermentable. And that's problematic for us as we try to understand fiber in a North American context, because if we look at the you know, research that's been done for many, many, many more years in uh, Europe, where they've looked at fiber and the effect of fiber on metabolism and nutrient utilization, they certainly have looked at sources of uh, fiber that are low in solubility and fermentability, but a lot of their fiber sources are highly fermentable and high in uh, fermentability, and, uh, and therefore we can't just take their data and extrapolate it to our circumstance. The substitution of highly digestible dietary carbohydrates then with fiber uh, potentially results in the reduction in dietary energy supply, but we wonder what is the impact on other dietary nutrients as well. Uh, in a previous study, Nestor looked at the relationship between one single component of fiber, and that is one sugar, xylose, and its ability to uh, uh, explain uh, um, over 70% of the variation in digestible and metabolizable energy across an array of nine different corn co-products. And that's really surprising because there's not a lot of xylose in any of those corn co-products. It obviously does vary. We're looking at co-products uh, uh, corn co-products that range from um, basically corn starch all the way over to corn bran. Uh, so there's a diversity of fat, and yet uh, the predictability of energy was very close to that of the change in xylose content. <clears throat> Though the digestibility of energy decreases with dietary fiber, the fermentation of fiber may contribute little to the overall energy balance of the growing and finishing pig. Um, there certainly was work came out of Europe that indicated that uh, fiber could represent a substantial portion, portion of the energy balance in gestating sows. But when we look at grow finished pigs, um, work that has come out of, uh, of uh, France and Denmark suggests that fiber, particularly insoluble fiber, does not contribute very much energy uh, to the growing and finishing pig. So there's a need for external fat and I'm going to differentiate between external fat or extracted fat and intact fat, i.e., and it came up in one of the earlier presentations, because there may be differences in the utilization of fat which is inherent in ingredient versus fat which is added as uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, a fat source like corn oil or soybean oil or choice white grease or whatever. Now, interestingly, fat may impair uh, microbial fermentation, so here we are, we have a high fiber diet, and we're adding fat to improve energy, but we may in fact be suppressing microbial fermentation, and that's from research from uh, Dagan et al. in 2009. But on the other hand, fat may slow down uh, the movement of digestive through the digestive tract, and that may help to improve fermentability. Um, but the increase in dietary fiber stimulates bowel movement and moves material through the gastrointestinal tract more quickly. So <clears throat> which is going to win the battle, so to speak? Is it the impact of fiber, which wants to move things through more quickly, or is it going to be the impact of fat, which wants to slow things down? So the objective of Nestor's study was to determine the effects of the dietary increase in fiber and fat from reduced oil DDGs, 
and uh, from soybean oil, looking at the apparent uh, ileal digestibility of, um, of amino acids, um, of acid hydrolyzed ether extract, and neutral detergent fiber. The experimental design, he had 18 cannulated uh, growing pigs, about 75 uh, pounds, individually housed in pans. Six dietary treatments, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, three period incomplete Latin square design, so each pig was on three different diets, but they were always put on a different diet than they'd been on uh, previously. We extended the time of the digestion study because many studies are only seven days or maybe nine or ten days in length, and we went to 14 days in length, trying to not have a huge variation in the weight of the pigs on trial, but at the same time recognizing that the adaptation to fiber may take some time in the pig. So we had a nine-day adaptation to period to the diet, two days of fecal collection, and three days of ileal collection, and feed was fed on a limited basis at 90% of what we estimated ad lib to be. So we had nine observations per treatment. So this is what the, um, what the diets look for, and all the rest of the data will be presented uh, when it's in table form. The level of soybean oil at 2 and 6%, and the level of the reduced oil DDGs at 0, 20, and 40%. Now, obviously, we did not attempt to balance the diets for energy, so we added uh, the DDGs and soybean oil at the expense of corn. We supplied the protein with casein because we did not want to confound the fiber. We wanted all of the fiber to be, quote, corn fiber, and so we didn't want to introduce soybean fiber as a, as a variable in, in that. Uh, so if we look at the chemical analysis of the diets, the acid hydrolyzed ether extract uh, ranged from 4.4 to 6.3, and then obviously 4% higher when we added uh, increased soybean oil from 2 to 6%. NDF was from around 7% up to 14 or 15%. Um, if we turn now to our analysis, Nestor analyzed the feed, the ileal digesta, and the fecal samples for NDF and, and ether extract, and the diets and ileal digesta for amino acids and therefore looked at the apparent ileal digestibility of the amino acids of NDF and of, um, um, of fat, and also looked at the apparent ileal digestibility of the amino acids. So turning to those, uh, that data, we can see that there was um, significant effect on the ileal, apparent ileal digestibility of the amino acids by increasing DDGs, and that's really not surprising. Um, we did not see an interaction between the oil and the DDGs. We only saw a significant effect of soybean oil when in, with respect to methionine and not with respect to lysine and threonine. But if you look at the actual numbers, uh, if the effect of soybean oil is relatively small, and that could just as easily be a beta uh, statistical error. I'm, in other words, I'm not sure it's, a, it's really that real. Um, but take a look now then at the apparent, digestibil uh, apparent digestibility of NDF. And the data are, are a little more complicated, so Nestor's presenting it um, using a, a surface diagram. And so if we look, and every time I present this figure, it's going to be turned so that you best see the response surface. So, and I apologize, but that's the only way we could do it. So in this case, you can see we go from 2% to 6% fat on this axis, and from 0 to 40% DDGs on this axis. And you'll see that at the, uh, the 0 DDGs, i.e. the lowest fiber diet, as we increase the fat, we actually did get an increase in the apparent ileal digestibility of NDF. However, as we got to the higher levels of fiber, when we added the oil, there was no improvement. In fact, if anything, there was a slight decrease in the apparent ileal digestibility of the NDF. So going back to that who wins the battle? Is it the fiber or the oil? In this instance, it would appear that fiber won over the oil. 
turning then to the total tract digestibility of NDF, now, as I said, we have to turn the graph. Now we go from 2 to 6% soybean oil on this graph and from 0 to 40% DDGs on this graph. So at 0% DDGs and going to 6% fat again over the total tract, we again see the improvement in apparent total tract digestibility of fiber. But when we're at 40% DDGs and we increase fat, the apparent total tract digestibility of fiber goes down. So in summary then, the apparent digestibility of NDF was greatest with high oil, extracted oil, and low fiber. The high fat and low fiber intake may increase the retention time, may increase the time of exposure of NDF to intestinal microbiota. And this observation, however, is offset when we increased uh, the, uh, um, the DDGs. At low levels of extracted fat with soybean oil, the apparent digestibility of NDF was not affected by fiber increasing in DDGs. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the digestibility of ether extract of fat and how it was affected by uh, fiber. What we see here, it's a much simpler situation, although we still see uh, an interaction between soybean oil and DDGs. Um, it's not nearly as dramatic as we saw with, uh, with NDF. Uh, what we see then as we go from 2% to 6% fat, we get an increase in the digestibility, the apparent ileal digestibility of, of acid hydrolyzed ether extract. When we go from 0 to 40% DDGs, we also get an increase in uh, digestibility of fat, and that's a bit surprising. And I'll come back to explain why that happened in just a minute. Let's turn our attention to the total tract digestibility of ether extract, and we really see the same profile. As we go from 2 to 6% fat, we get a substantial increase in digestibility of uh, ether extract. When we increase the fiber uh, content, we get an increase in uh, digestibility. Uh, but when we have 6% fat, there's not much impact of fiber. Now that, at least at first blush, presents a conundrum. And this is why I really wish that Nestor was here, because he should get credit for the next part, because I think he's come up with a really excellent explanation. And that is, sorry, that we have to take in to account endogenous losses. And we now see this in many studies looking at the digestibility of fat if we don't take this into account. This is a, a standard figure that many of you would, or all of you would have seen when we're trying to explain the difference between apparent digestibility of amino acids where at very low levels of amino acid, the effect of endogenous secretion is profound and really causes us to underestimate digestibility, that when we adjust for, uh, go to standardized uh, ileal digestibility, then we flatten that out because we're now taking into account at least some of the endogenous secretions. Well, what happens if we do that for fat digestibility? So if we look at the apparent ileal digestibility of, uh, of fat across these diets, it looks like that we have higher digestibility when we have 6% added fat. And the logical conclusion would be, well, it's higher because the free fat that we've added as soybean oil is more highly digested than the fat that is present in the DDGs and corn itself, i.e., the fat that's inherent in the ingredient, because the apparent ileal digestibility is lower in, um, in uh, uh, the 2% fat diet. However, if we adjust for, uh, by regression analysis for the endogenous secretions, what we find then is that there's absolutely no difference in the digestibility, whether it was 2% fat or 6% added fat, remembering that over here the impact of endogenous secretions would be much more profound. 
And so by accounting for those endogenous secretions, we now see that the fat is of equal digestibility, whether it came from DDGs or whether it came from soybean oil. If we look at the uh, total tract digestibility, sorry, uh, look at the total tract digestibility, we can see a similar uh, situation where when we looked at the apparent total tract digestibility, it looked like we had higher digestibility with the added fat, but when we account for the endogenous secretions, there's really no difference. So the good news is when we've worried about these fat sources in, in inherent in the ingredients as being less digestible, uh, it would appear that this is not true. And I'm going to talk about this much more detail this afternoon in the, uh, uh, in the session in the, next, uh, in the next room. So closing up then, the inclusion of co-products from corn ethanol distill distillation industry may decrease the apparent ileal digestibility of amino acids. Uh, and this decrease may be the impact of heat damage or some other factor. The apparent ileal digestibility of the amino acids was not affected by the uh, increase in oil. The apparent digestibility of NDF was modulated by the dietary fat and fiber intake from soybean oil and DDGs. The increase in retention time um, of digested due to high fat and low fiber intake and the increase in time of exposure of NDF to the, um, to the intestinal microbiota. The apparent digestibility of ether extract was modulated by dietary concentration of fat from soybean oil and DDGs. The low values of apparent digestibility of apparent, uh, of, sorry, um, acid hydrolyzed ether extract in diets with low fat concentrations are the result of endogenous losses of ether extract, and no differences were observed among treatments for true digestibility of um, ether extract.